So, ladies and uh, gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to this uh, evening's uh, panel on Russia's view uh, of the international order. On behalf of uh, Delphi Economic Forum, uh, as well as the Institute of International Relations, um, in um, 1939, Churchill described Russia as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, distilling what an uncomprehending West feels as the otherness of an eccentric power. Many Westerners have but a sallow understanding of Russia. They project onto it characteristics that are not necessarily consistent with reality, or they see only part of the picture, adopting unexamined stereotypical views. As a result, we often assess Russia on the basis of Western standards, over or underestimating it, and failing to, fu to fully understand the trends and dynamics that supervene within the country to influence its foreign policy. There are opportunities as well as risks for Moscow in the post-Western world of multiple uncertainties. And uh, this evening's panel, we try to shed light on many factors that will define Russia's fate and its relations with the West, especially uh, with the world, especially the West. And uh, our speakers from uh, diverse backgrounds will provide us uh, insightful answers uh, to uh, a number of uh, questions, but uh, mainly uh, on Russia's view of the international order. Uh, before I give the floor uh, to Mr. Les Wallander, uh, the president and CEO of the U.S.-Russian Foundation, I just want to stress that uh, uh, among the prominent speakers and, of course, uh, the, the, the audience is uh, uh, Greece's uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Professor Nikos uh, Kozias, uh, and I welcome him. So, uh, Ms. Wolander, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak and join you in this discussion tonight. Um, I'm going to start by simply offering the um, point, which I believe is not political or critical, it's simply analytical, that the fundamental answer to the question is that Russia, the Russian Federation, is a revisionist power with respect to the international order. An internet, a revisionist power is a power that uh, does not uh, fully accept and seeks to change the international rules of the game. So that's what I mean by it is a neutral analytical term. And Russia is not the only revisionist power in the current international system. Um, most experts on China would also identify China as a revisionist power. And there are multiple countries, I would actually say, in the international system that complain about, seek to change, and push against the international rules of the game. The difference, though, I want to highlight is that Russia and China have the power uh, and ability to push back more effectively than many. And so the implications of Russia's policies and its actions are greater than those of uh, perhaps other countries in the international system that find themselves unhappy with the international order. I'm going to give a few, some examples and explain why I think uh, the Russian Federation is uh, uh, identified as a revisionist power and has adopted that approach. Um, but, so, but I'm going to try and do that within my limited time because I especially want to respect my colleagues on the panel and hear the diversity of views that I know um, we're all looking forward to. Now, I want to start, though, by pointing out that it's not the case that the Russian Federation pushes against or does not like all international rules or all international institutions. The, the Russian Federation is a strong supporter of the UN Security Council, where Russia holds veto power as a permanent member of the Security Council. Russia, as far as I understand, Russian policy uh, does support uh, the New START Treaty, and uh, Russian officials have indicated that they are ready to discuss extension of the New START Treaty, the bilateral treaty on strategic nuclear weapons with the United States. Russia, Russia is a strong uh, supporter of the G20 uh, until it was expelled from the G8 in 2014 as a result of its invasion of Ukraine. Russia was a strong supporter and active participant in the G8 
And I do want to note that Russia is one of the strongest leaders of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and has consistently worked with all the members of that treaty to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Now, what is in common in those institutions and organizations and rules that Russia does support? Well, I would argue that the common element is um, Russia's security interests and institutions that puts Russian leadership at the center of international multilateral diplomacy and enhances Russia's political power and role in being a decisive force in the international system. Obviously, the UN Security Council um, a seat is the most important of those, but I think the others I mentioned are um, significant as well. Now, what institutions has the Russian Federation expressed uh, dislike of, uh, discomfort with, and sought to constrain or undermine? Well, the obvious one is NATO, and the reason there is obvious, because Russia is not a member of NATO, so it has no influence over NATO decisions, NATO actions, NATO's evolution. Um, but there are others as well that Russia, the Russian Federation has complained about um, and has sought to change or divert from their original purposes and rules. Uh, one, and there are many, I'm just going to give examples. One is the OSCE. Russia was uh, an original member of the new OSCE after the Cold War and initially was a strong supporter of the role of the OSCE in European security, but it has now come to express concern about many of the OSCE's functions, such as election monitoring, such as supporting civil society and other aspects of OSCE's core work. Um, the Russian Federation has expressed concerns about the Council of Europe and its remit in Europe and its uh, at rules and the exercise of its rules. And then more fundamentally on the global stage, Russia has by, uh, through its words, but also I think even more importantly through its actions, challenged the UN Charter itself. And in particular, I want to highlight two elements of the UN Charter that are extremely important to all countries in the international systems because their rules keep us all safe that Russia has challenged through its actions and through its policies. Um, one is the changing of borders through the unilateral use of force in Georgia uh, in 2008 and in Ukraine in 2014. And also, Russia has sought through its foreign policy position, through its uh, profile on the international uh, stage, through its role in uh, the UN Security Council and also for us such as the G20, to argue for a limited version of sovereignty for Russia's neighbors. And in particular, that Russia's neighbors, Ukraine, Georgia, and others, um, do not have the right to choose their own international organizations and associations. NATO is the obvious case. But again, the 2014 crisis was precipitated because, e the, because Ukraine was seeking to sign an EU association agreement that entailed visa-free travel and a reduction in trade barriers, ultimate, meant to um, result ultimately in um, free trade between the Ukraine and the EU. So there's a narrative in the United States that this is all about NATO, that Russian revisionism is all about NATO and NATO's crimes uh, since the end of the Cold War, so-called so crimes. But in fact, the resistance and the complaints, and I, am, I, can, I can cite you chapter and verse of statements from uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and President Putin complaining about the institutions I've just laid out, including the EU uh, and in its advancement of partnership and cooperation with the countries that lie in Eastern Europe. And I think that is the one that troubles uh, I know many American analysts, but many uh, supporters of multilateralism and the international order. It's okay to have disagreements about NATO, and many of Russia's concerns are understandable uh, in terms of Russian national security and Russian national interests. But to cut at the heart of what the UN is and the UN Charter risks threatening all countries in the international system which need a basis for approaching multilateral engagement in a way that doesn't lead to conflict, war, and the use of force, but instead focuses on diplomacy, mutual acceptance of the rules of the game, 
And the last point I want to make, it is okay to want to change the international system and the international rules of the game. The international rules of the game have changed over history and in fact have changed since the end of the Cold War. I could point to, for example, um, the, the right to protect, which only was adopted by the international community in 2005, or the law of the sea treaty, which my country hasn't, um, hasn't ratified, but many countries have. International law and, and the international order evolve over time. But to unilaterally seek to advance revisionist objectives and goals is itself a violation of those rules on how the rules are changed. And I think more than anything else, that is what raised alarm bells in America, in Europe, and, and also in Asia among some of America's Asian allies as a result of Russian actions um, in 2014 in particular. Last point. I think actually Russia benefits from the international rules of the game. I think those rules of the game help to facilitate trade, protection of investment, free flow of ideas and people, that those rules of the game protect the Russian Federation, which itself has territory, which back in history could, was claimed by other countries and other empires and civilizations. So I would hope that as Russia thinks through the rules of the game that it doesn't like and that it would like to see modified, it recognizes and Russians recognize that those rules of the game actually also contribute to Russian interests and an approach that recognize that as well as the dis discontent would be a better basis for moving forward in discussing the international order. Thank you. have 55 minutes, six speakers remaining, and um, a Q&A session, hopefully, we'll see. So I just want to, to ask you to uh, stick uh, to the initial agreement that we uh, made uh, through the exchange of emails. Now I'll give the floor to uh, His Excellency Ambassador uh, Tsisov, um, who is Russia's ambassador to the European Union and uh, Humitsky, if it was uh, uh, solely a Greek uh, audience, uh, he could have very well delivered his speech in, uh, in Greek. He's very fluent in uh, Greek, but I presume that uh, he will uh, do it in English. Instead, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. I would suggest that we start from the beginning and try to contemplate what the international world order is per se. For centuries, the world lived within the Westphalian sovereignty. Then the First World War brought us the system of Versailles. And in 1945, in the Russian city of Yalta, countries of the anti-Hitler coalition agreed on how they would coexist, taking into account the results of the Second World War. However, those agreements were soon swept away by the waves of a new confrontation, namely the Cold War. But the moment came when the Cold War, with its concept of mutual assured destruction, was gone too. What did then come to replace it? Alas, while a part of our Eurasian continent was going through painful political and economic transformations in pursuit of an optimal democratic organization and a fair market model that would suit it most, the so-called enlightened West, professing its alleged experience and wisdom, proclaimed the end of history, and defined the triumph of an arbitrary set of liberal values and globalization as the world development vector with no alternative, as the new formula of bright future for all mankind. However, Failure awaited the authors of social, economic, and political engineering at this turn as well. The basically objective globalization process didn't follow the path they had marked. It became obvious that other continents and centers of power, rather than traditional West, were starting to play a key role in it. Thereby, the world entered an era of multipolarity. It's not a coincidence it's not a coincidence that at the current stage we witness the widest ever polarity of opinions 
on what the international world order is, and more importantly, what it should be. It's common knowledge that modern system of international law was formed within the institutions that had been established following the Second World War. First of all, the UN, but also the European Union, the Council of Europe, the OEC, and no matter how paradoxical it may sound, NATO. The latter, I would note, continuing to spasmodically enlarge rather out of necessity than choice. However, today the very notion of international law is subject to revision and dilution. I'm not surprised that Ms. Wallander never referred to international law once. For a number of years now, our European and American partners, instead of adhering to this well-known and clear-cut term, have been implanting in their vocabulary and official documents the formula internationally recognized rules and norms. Moreover, they are trying to accustom their interlocutors around the world to it. Meanwhile, inventors of this novelty find it difficult to explain what the difference between law and, and these uh, rules and norms is, and who and when had actually recognized the latter. It is natural that Russia being a responsible international player, a nuclear power, and a permanent member of the UN Security Council, should be concerned with this situation. We have felt this thread long enough, and as I would repeat, a responsible power have generated quite a few far-reaching initiatives throughout the last two decades that are aimed at strengthening the world order on the basis of international law and establishing such a security system, first and foremost in Europe, that would provide equal guarantees to all. Besides, Russia has never tried to monopolize this work, was always open to cooperation with those who were ready to take part in it. Neither did we refuse initiatives suggested by others. For instance, when in 2010 NATO published its strategic concept, we positively assessed well-formulated principles of security guarantees and suggested extending them to all countries of Europe. The answer we got was, our proposal is for alliance members only, so please be content with second-class security. It's clear that with such an approach, talking about equal distribution of security guarantees over Eurasian space was pointless. Against this background, some European countries opted for a simplified way, gave up and rushed to join NATO without thinking that the day would come when they would be requested to incur unbearable and unjustified expenses, participate in missions and operations far from their borders and interests, as well as deploy foreign military bases on their territories. And the Russian proposal to sign a European security treaty that would have provided for making legally binding the well-known principle that no one shall enhance one's security at the expense of security of others, enshrined, by the way, as a political commitment in the OSC Charter for European Security, signed by 54 heads of state and government, remained unaddressed. However, even under, uh, even under such circumstances, we do not give up and continue upholding the above-mentioned principles. Meanwhile, given particular aspects of Russian mentality, political culture, and perhaps old-fashioned, as it may seem to many, concept of decency, Moscow never imposes anything on anyone and doesn't inter interfere in the internal affairs of other states contrary to statements certain capitals consider it possible to make following the fashion of blaming omnipotent Russia for all the troubles of the world. At the same time, some of our prosecutors feel free to impose on other countries their own views on how the latter should live in such a cynical manner that can be described as absolute disregard for all norms of interstate behavior. One doesn't need to go far to find examples. Right now, we are witnessing Washington's unprecedented interference in domestic affairs of Venezuela. The U.S. openly calls on the military of the country to defect to a self-proclaimed political leader and threaten with persecution those who will remain faithful, faithful to their oath. Genuine economic terror is unleashed, 
sinister extraterritorial sanctions are introduced, Washington managed to wear down EU member states, except I would particularly stress Greece, Cyprus, Slovakia, and Italy, as well as the Vatican, resulting in the fact that the so-called international contact group formed by the EU took a biased stance and thereby deprived itself of the opportunity to act as an impartial mediator. The situation around Venezuela is obviously a manifestation of a consistent systemic line to ruin the current architecture of world legal order rather than a solitary case or unremarkable episode. Planting across the information sphere unsupported accusations against certain countries of carrying out hideous chemical attacks and immediately without any judicial proceedings imposing sanctions or even launching airstrikes are considered to be almost the norm today or the new normality. It is particularly alarming that this line is also adopted in the military sphere, in non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. We have to acknowledge that today's situation is in a way much more dangerous than the one of the Cold War years. Then for all the depth of ideological differences, common sense and responsibility for the world's fate pushed antagonistic powers to take wise decisions in the area of arms control and disarmament. Today, we're virtually on the edge of the last line. Its crossing will mean complete dismantling of checks and balances in the nuclear field. And it's not about passions or whims of particular leaders. It's rather about a consistent policy that was formed as long as 17 years ago, at the times of a different US administration, the one that derailed the anti-ballistic missile treaty. And each time Washington denounced another treaty with Russia, it was done under an absolute absolutely invented pretext. As a result, the New START Treaty is in fact the only one left, its lifespan stretching only until, until 5th of February 2021. A similar situation is observed in the field of economy. It is worth noting that the system of pipelines ensuring European energy security was created when the Cold War was at its height. In those days, there existed, of course, forces that tried to hinder the development of these projects, but the then <coughs> leaders of countries of Western Europe managed to, fight, to find the strength not to submit to this pressure. We can only hope that the current generation of European leaders will inherit their courage. Speaking about the economy, I need to emphasize that attempts to influence Russia's policy via sanctions are ridiculous. Events of recent years demonstrated that such efforts are vain and, by the way, make interests of European business also suffer a lot, as well as our relations in general, including with our largest trade and economic partner, the European Union. Against this backdrop, the easiest thing for Russia to do would be to follow a trend that is in fashion today and pivot to Asia, especially since it's there that the bigger part of my country's territory lies. Actually, we are increasingly active in developing mutually beneficial cooperation with China, ASEAN countries, and other Asian partners. But we are not doing it to undermine or punish Europe. We are not making friends against Europe or the West as a whole. Figuratively speaking, we are implementing the concept projected by the Russian coat of arms, whose double-headed eagle, though admittedly inherited from our common and ancestral homeland with Greece, Byzantium, looks at the same time to the west and to the east. I would add that Russia as a country located on two continents and thereby uniting Eurasia by virtue of its geography, history, and cultural tradition is genuinely interested in maintaining equally friendly relations on the west and on the east. Yeah. yeah that's Currently, leaders of major EU countries are more and more often thinking of a new configuration of cooperation in Europe and more outspoken about the need to take their fate in their hands. I believe it's important that EU member states remember that they will not be able to uphold their positions against rising economic giants in Asia today, in Latin America tomorrow, in Africa the day after, unless they listen closely to Russia's words about establishing 
a common economic and humanitarian space in Eurasia. Defending what we call European civilization is only possible if one of its supporting pillars, Russia, is fully engaged. Meanwhile, the world is witnessing a deficit of mutual responsibility of nation states, including those the UN Charter assigns with special responsibility for maintaining global peace and security. Aspiring <coughs> in no way to the laurels of the Oracle of Delphi, I would nevertheless take the courage to predict, unless Russia's partners in the UN Security Council shoulder this responsibility, a legal jungle will emerge on our planet faster than we may assume. In my view, it would be an extremely lamentable outcome of reflecting on the heritage of the first Democrats in the history of mankind, those who lived in ancient Greece, and I'm sure put much brighter hopes on their descendants. Thank you. You said that your goodwill gesture to us was that you spoke in English. My goodwill gesture to you was that I was too flexible with you on time. Uh, so, uh, now I uh, immediately uh, pass the floor to Stephen Lander, uh, who is the chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times in, uh, in Brussels. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and I will try to keep to my time. Um, first, I would say, I've spent a lot of time in the former Soviet Union. First, when it was the Soviet Union, I lived in Moscow for five years, traveled the country, have great affection for it, um, want Russia to be happy, which is a very difficult task because many Russians are only happy when they're unhappy about something. At least that was my great conclusion after many Thank nights of vodka <laughs> at around the kitchen table. Um, I'm a journalist. I'm not an American official. I'm not a Russian official. I try to be cold. Um, I will follow from the ambassador's notion. Relationships are like world orders. They get stale, and they fade, and they fail. And you would, could start with the Congress of Congress of Vienna, which held the peace for a hundred years. What produced the First World War was pretty clear. What ended the First World War was a bad treaty, Versailles. And it caused revanchism in Germany very, very quickly. And then we had the post-World War II settlement, Yalta, you mentioned. Um, the building of multilateral institutions, of NATO, the Warsaw Pact, having visited both sides. Um, now this is falling apart too in its way because the post-Cold War order is shaky. And this is what I want to say, having spent a lot of time talking to Russians, thinking about Russians. Russia, in a way, is Germany in 1918. It feels a bad settlement has been imposed upon it when it was weak, when it could not respond, that its adversaries, the West, took advantage of it, that it broke its, its relationships with some of the countries it's had relationships with for centuries. I mean, after all, Rus started in Kiev. That's where the nation started, the idea started, so the comparison with Kosovo is not wrong. And there is a real sense, having been there when everything collapsed in 91, having watched the flag go down and the new flag go up, um, of resentment and defensiveness and anger and a desire to restore the dignity of Russia and the influence of Russia over its traditional partners and neighbors. And I think that's important, and I think we all really need to understand that. There's partly a sense of defensive nationalism, but also there is a sense that the West took advantage of us and keeps pressing, whether it's Montenegro, or if I can say it now, North Macedonia, um, filling the holes even in the Balkans, um, and why Russia is so afraid or so upset 
why it sees this as a threat is a question I've often thought about. But I think it's very real. Um, and it is worth reminding people, in 1991, there was a real risk the whole country would spin apart, that Russia itself would spin apart. Tatarstan, Chechnya, I covered the first Chechen war. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. I've covered Budyonovsk. I mean, there were real risks of Islamic terrorism, of internal dissent, and so a kind of crackdown was coming, one way or another, to at least hold Russia together. Now, what that none of this, to me, um, excuses um, what happened in Ukraine. But I was in Ukraine. I was in the Maidan. I watched what happened. Had Yanukovych not run away, one wonders whether any of this would have been necessary, frankly. I mean, I was talking to Radek Sikorsky, who was there, talking to, um, to him Yanukovych. Yanukovych didn't like the deal. He was called away to the phone. It was Putin on the phone, who had been listening into the deal. Putin told him to sign. Yanukovych came back and signed, and then things began to fall apart. But had they not fallen apart, I don't think you would have annexed Crimea. I don't think we'd been in this circumstance. So I mean, one has to be careful not to make huge judgments about what sometimes come from historical accidents. So that's my only real appeal, which is that we understand as best we can what Russia is, what Russia wants, and um, understand it's a neighbor that isn't leaving. It is, takes a very important part of the European space. Now, that's not to say we need to accept what Russia does. I don't know why Russia feels the need to meddle in our elections. Maybe you can explain that. What, I mean, why it thinks that undermining the EU is a good idea. EU is not NATO. You will say you don't do any of this. I accept that. But this is one of the great mysteries, which goes to the heart of what is the nature of Russian paranoia. I understand the nature of Russian pride. I don't always understand the nature of Russian paranoia. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm an optimistic by nature. We have four speakers, 35 minutes. If I multiply your interventions uh, by five, this makes it 20 minutes. And then we will have 15 minutes for the Q&A. Uh, please try to uh, respect that. Uh, I will start with uh, Ms. Molly Montgomery, <coughs> Vice President of the Albright uh, Stonebridge Foundation of the United States. Great. Well, I have my orders, so I will try to be really brief. Um, and I want to go, uh, you know, sort of from the past to the present and really to practicalities and pick up uh, where Celeste left off. I think she did a great job of describing um, Russia as a revisionist power, um, what it wants, and I want to talk about how, how it wants, how it tries to get that, um, to make those goals happen. Um, so if, if Russia's primary foreign policy goal is to create a multipolar world, as we heard from the ambassador, um, you know, I would say that's similar to a model of great power competition uh, in, the, in the 19th century. Uh, hoping to see Russia as a regional hegemon that controls a sphere of influence and that commands respect, as Steve said, um, which r many Russians believe uh, it has not gotten since the end of the Cold War. Um, the strategy, I would argue, that Russia uses uh, is to undermine and to paralyze uh, Western institutions and to sow division and discord among Western countries and within our societies to induce the collapse, uh, or at least the revision, uh, as we've discussed, of the post-World War II international order. And so to achieve this, uh, Russia turns to an extensive toolkit of hybrid warfare tactics. And that's really what I want to talk about today and how it tailors those, the tools that it uses uh, to each country, to its weaknesses, to its vulnerabilities, and to opportunities that may come along. At the most extreme end of the spectrum, uh, you have invading sovereign countries uh, in violation of international law. 
And so here we can talk about Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova. Uh, we have assassinations, sabotage, attempted coups, and other kinetic measures. Less extreme tactics include energy cutoffs, cyber attacks, election interference, funding extremist groups, strategic investments, using the Orthodox Church as an agent of influence, propaganda, and disinformation. In the past, the closer that you were geographically uh, to the Kremlin, the more likely you were to experience the extreme end uh, of that toolkit. And so Ukraine is obviously the perfect example where we have seen the entire spectrum uh, of, of those tools employed, particularly over the last five years. Um, but the further you were away from Moscow geographically, and the more integrated you were in your Atlantic institutions, um, the lighter the touch uh, you were likely to feel and the more deniable those actions would be, uh, since obviously it, it was in Russia's interest to avoid confrontation and, and potential consequences. Um, but I would argue that the problem we see these days is that since Russia's invasion of Crimea hardened uh, Western views of Russia as often a negative actor in the international system, um, we have seen that there are fewer limits on the tactics that Russia will employ across the West. Um, I guess, you know, to some extent, the rationale could be seen as if you're already viewed as the bad guy, why not take advantage? What do you have to lose? And so that's why we've seen increasingly brazen uh, hybrid warfare activities uh, being used across Europe. And obviously, some <coughs> examples are the Russian-backed attempted coup uh, in Montenegro in 2016, which was intended to prevent their accession to, to NATO, the Skripal attack in the UK last year, and obviously widespread election interference, including in our presidential election in 2016. Um, and so this isn't going away, um, and it's happening all over Europe, including here in Greece, as we saw with uh, the Greek government's decision to expel two uh, Russian agents over uh, attempts to interfere in the PRESPA um, implement agreement implementation. Um, and. I would just note that there are events uh, coming up in the future, such as the European elections uh, in May, as well as a lot of local elections, including here, um, such as North Macedonia's uh, accession to NATO, uh, that are really ripe uh, for uh, further activities like these. And you know, these activities, these tactics are opportunistic and they play on weak spots in the West. And so we're not pr very well prepared to deal with them. Uh, but as we say, the first step is admitting you have a problem. So I would say in the West, it's time that we open our eyes, that we get serious about the problem, and that we work together to strengthen our institutions and develop ways to de defer and defend against these types of tactics. That's a conversation we need to be having uh, among governments. It's also a conversation we need to be having as societies. Um, and to close, I'll just say, uh, for those of you who want to be a part of those conversations, a good place to start would be uh, the Disinfo Week event uh, in Athens on Monday that is being uh, hosted by the Atlantic Council. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Yakunin, the founder of the Dialogue of Civilization uh, Research Institute uh, in uh, Russia, uh, is the next speaker. Okay, thank you. You know, this is an uh, assumption of some <coughs> studies. That uh, Dialogue of Civilization is Russian Institute. It is not. I am Russian but I'm chairman of German legal entity, think tank, Dialogue of Civilization Research Institute with the background and history of more than 18 years. So because we have representative of Russia here, my good friend, His Excellency Ambassador Chizhov, 
you know, I have no right to talk on the part of Russia, but I have the right to talk in my both capacities, researcher and Russian citizen. From this point of view, I suppose that we are presenting a very good example of a fairer tale about Alice. You remember? One side of the mirror and the other side of the mirror. But when you are looking into the mirror, you are already losing the perspective because what is right actually in the mirror is left and vice versa. But now imagine that the other side is standing behind the mirror. So my uh, humble assessment is that when we are talking about global politics, when we are talking about politics of United States or Russia or China, etc., that is more or less a reflection of our understanding, not the objective understanding or objective situation in the world. So from this point of view, I would like to suggest a little bit different angle of view, not Russian angle, but you know, Euro-Asian kind of perspective citing the title of our session. And here, firstly, I would like to say, when we are talking world order, the only world order which I know, maybe I am not, I am ignorant, that is the world order which was set after the Second World War. It was set by four winning parties. Because of that, we have United Nations as the major institute of these settings. After that, you know, we were in the situation of crisis, and this crisis started with the dissolution of the Soviet Union as one of the pillow of the world order. This is true. We are in transaction period. So when anybody is talking about international law or international order, that is again some kind of reflection from the mirror. And we should understand that, and we should accept that. World is in transaction. So the very severe blow to the existing system was launched by the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and it was continued by the crisis of 2008. Because it, is, was, it was a blow, to my mind, to the hegemonic structure of the world after the finish of so-called Cold War. Why somebody is calling the Cold War Cold War, I also don't understand. Because during the period of Cold War, the losses of lives stated by some experts were amounting up to 20 million people in different parts of the world. So it is better something different than the Cold War. That's why our politicians are avoiding to say that we are in the frame of some another you know, fraction of the Cold War. This is first. Secondly, when I am referring, yes, no problem. When we are talking about the existing system, I'd rather suggest to cite it or to name it hegemonic system. But since United States declared that they don't want to be guarantors of the world order nowadays, this is world where the even hegemon cannot provide the stability which all the countries are facing. From this point of view, I would like to remind you that the concept of Euro-Asia from Lisbon to Vladivostok was not invented or written to the President Putin. It was declared by General de Gaulle. So again, when we are citing that Eurasia is a concept of Russian revisionism, listen, that is not Russian revisionism. This is historical attempt to create a better world on the Euro-Asian continent. In 2008, in Singapore, I declared that the world structure from the geopolitical point of view will change. One of the region could be Euro-Asia. So I suppose <coughs> when we are talking about position of Russia, China, or Great, uh, United States of America or Great Britain, we should start to try to find the solutions, not just what is putting us aside. So, you know, I'm finished. 
I'm ready to answer questions. I have much more written, but I suppose in this audience it is enough. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Spiros Litsas is uh, the next uh, speaker. Uh, apart from being a, a friend, he's also Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Macedonia. Thank you, Kostadina. It's uh, great being here uh, once again. Uh, I'm an academic, as uh, Kostadinos said. Therefore, I'll try to be provocative. At the same time, I'm a realist. Therefore, I'll try to deliver an analysis, five minutes analysis, Kostadina, all right, uh, containing no moral messages, uh, focusing on national and systemic interest uh, as well. I'm going to give you, uh, since the fact that uh, we'll try to decipher uh, uh, Russia's uh, behavior uh, in uh, international system, uh, which is very difficult, uh, I'll give you three examples. Uh, first of all, not a lot of people know that since 2017, uh, Russia has um, uh, invested $4 billion uh, in Erbil in uh, Kurdish energy sector. Very important because we all know that uh, Northern Kurdistan, uh, apart from being a uh, pivotal uh, element in um, uh, Iraqi uh, political um, equilibrium of power, uh, at the same time is, uh, 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 how can I say that, uh, is uh, very close to, uh, to the Western world. A uh, second example, uh, an, open, an open flirt uh, between Moscow and Ankara uh, regarding the well-known S-400 uh, in addition, uh, the energy uh, game, uh, Turkey Stream 1, Turkey Stream 2, uh, that is going to run um, um, uh, underneath uh, the uh, Black Sea. Third uh, paradigm uh, is uh, the uh, emerging uh, flirt uh, with uh, Egypt. Uh, nowadays, um, uh, Russia is playing a, a, a great role uh, regarding the restructuring of uh, the Egyptian energy sector. Rosatom uh, is going to construct uh, the nuclear plant uh, in uh, Deba. Uh, plus, uh, the fact uh, that um, uh, there is uh, an armed deal, I would like to remind to the audience since the fact that um, uh, we have to deal with uh, history as well, not only with IR theory, that uh, the arms uh, issue was the main uh, excuse or you know, the beginning of uh, the uh, Suez crisis back uh, in uh, the 50s. So uh, here we have uh, a great difference um, uh, from the Cold War uh, era. Nowadays, Russia does not want to uh, collect client states. Nowadays, Russia, and I fully agree with uh, Molly, uh, wants to disrupt uh, the uh, Western narrative. Like, we cannot do that by ourselves. We are doing that, you know, in a perfect uh, way, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, this uh, kind of um, uh, disruption uh, is against Russian interest, on the one hand, I'm going to uh, elaborate on that later on, and on the uh, systemic stability, uh, on the other hand. Uh, there is another um, uh, uh, paradigm that uh, is very useful um, uh, regarding our analysis, uh, the fact that uh, since 2007, uh, Russia is trying to develop a new soft power uh, agenda. One of the main sectors of this new soft power agenda is the uh, Christian Orthodox uh, agenda. That's why it uh, openly um, uh, is criticizing or you know is questioning. Peter, you have uh, one minute. Yeah, I know that. The so that I'm not accused ecumenical in the friend, patriarchate. So I have two minutes. Now. All right. No, no, no. Yeah. It's one. It's one. It's one. Uh, it's actually 55 seconds. All right. Uh, the fact uh, is uh, the following: that uh, 
all these um, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the methodology, uh, the methodology regarding Russian's foreign policy is incompatible with the multipolar system. Uh, Russia, unfortunately, is uh, promoting a zero-sum game. Uh, and uh, this does not uh, go hand in hand with uh, the multipolar system that uh, you know, the great powers uh, have to sit around a table uh, exploring uh, fields uh, regarding cooperation, synergies, and so on and so forth. And since the fact that I'm a realist, and I'm going to uh, support here that uh, multi-polar uh, multi system uh, is not a Hobbesian uh, field of um, uh, competing and antagonism uh, each other, uh, I have to say the following, that Russia has uh, more to, to gain um, in being creative in sectors such as um, uh, the IT future of um, uh, humanity, uh, energy, academia, and so on and so forth, than trying to uh, disrupt uh, the Western uh, narrative. Perhaps the Western world is facing issues nowadays. However, we all know that transatlanticism is our common future. Thank you. There are figures in the Western world that uh, undermine uh, the Western world from, uh, from inside. Uh, uh, last but not least is uh, Mr. Uh, Anisimov, uh, the Deputy in Chief of uh, Sputnik News Agency in Radio of uh, Russia, whom I presume is not going to attend next week's uh, disinfo um, uh, event uh, organized by Atlantic Council. So the floor is yours. Well, we could do that. Um, I mean, Hi, since English is not my native language, you please bear with me. Um, I'll try and keep it short. I understand your problem, problems with the time here. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of Russian people, definitely. I'm just a single, proud, paranoid, revisionist, opportunist uh, Russian journalist. Um, it's hard to be last speaker since so many um, interesting things have been said so far. Um, and there's really nothing much to add. But um, what I guess I'll, I'll just try and share one observation. Uh, the forum like this, this is a great platform to exchange opinions. And um, I may not look like it, but I've actually taken part in uh, quite a few of these uh, all around the globe, not just in, in Europe. And there's an interesting comparison. For example, if you go to China and you um, talk to the Chinese media or Chinese representatives and officials, um, the dialogue will be focused mainly on bilateral cooperation, like mutually beneficial cooperation. We're talking culture, we're, we're talking um, investment, we'll be talking like uh, even um, uh, political cooperation between the two countries. Uh, the same would probably happen, not probably because it happens so in India, <coughs> because, well, Russia, since the Soviet times, has uh, great rela rela relations with India, so the topic will again be like mutually beneficial cooperation there too. Um, if we move further to, to Latin America, South America, uh, where many social countries, uh, socialist countries, I'm sorry, socialist countries uh, have been having good relations with Russian Soviet Union previously, uh, we will again discuss bilateral cooperation with them and focus on the positive things and trying to um, improve of the, on the relations that we already have. Um, and even in the Middle East, which is a very complex, like very tough region, because there are many countries with uh, their own agenda that differs greatly from one another. And another uh, we would, uh, like, when Russians go there, we will still try and communicate and uh, see how we can overcome the differences that we have, because we do have differences with many countries in, in, in the Middle East, definitely. Um, but whenever it happens, like a forum like this is taking place in Europe, we just um, end up in some weird, like, yakety sex blame game, um, listing the same things that have been mentioned for, for decades now. Like, uh, every, every, every aspect that you've already mentioned, we've heard that so many times. And that's basically what we've just, like, witnessed and been witnessing for, for um, half an hour or so. Um, it would be, it's just like, I know that countries have different political agendas, but this is the opportunity, I guess, where we just don't just list the uh, differences that we have, but try and communicate on how to solve the differences. And uh, uh, saying that Russia is trying to undermine the um, world order, I say that 
um, we only hear that from the European part and the United States part. And uh, that's probably okay because as Europe and the United States are key parts of this world, they're very important, but they're definitely not the biggest part of this world. So being the Russian that I am, I think it's okay. I think it's okay for me that we have um, beneficial cooperation with China and India and Latin America and uh, many countries in the Middle East. We so far haven't reached an agreement with Europe and uh, the United States, but hopefully we can um, overcome the differences. And that's it. Thank you so much. Great. <laughs> Thanks for being uh, very short in your intervention, which means that we have uh, around 15 minutes for the Q&A. I suggest that uh, we collect questions and uh, I also encourage you to raise questions, not make observations or comments. So if there are any questions, please feel free, introduce yourself and um, raise the question directly. Yes, please. No, no. You need the micro. For the, for the translators, you need the micro. Yeah, you can do it from here. Uh, hello, you're, not, you're not the eighth speaker, okay? Just raise yeah, a question, okay? Hello, my name is Iskander al Kubaev and I'm coming from Kazakhstan. I just have a simple question. How do you see the, the, the medium-term and short-term perspective of between the, uh, of negotiation between Russia and, uh, and the U.S.? What's your take on that? Where do you address the question? So how do you view the... To whom, uh, to whom do you? To the panel. To the... Yes. Okay. INF? What? Basically, the, the between two countries, how are we going to solve the, the disputes between you, I mean, between two countries on different matters? Ah, in general terms, okay. Uh, next question, the gentleman. Hello, my name is Socrates. I'm a student of International European Studies in the University of Macedonia. And my question is, uh, the emergence of the, a new subsystem, which is called the East Mediterranean, uh, I want to ask the panel uh, which, uh, which is the, the Russians' view towards this subsystem, uh, considering it's a great asset there, which is uh, it's a naval uh, base Tartus and uh, air base uh, Hamimim. Thank you. Great. The gentleman there. And if we can change the micro, I mean, it's, w we can't really hear the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Working? Uh, yeah. okay. Thank you very much. I'm Khagani from Iran. Obviously, Russia and Iran, from gas reserves point of view, are first and second. And the EU and Greece is also playing a major role for energy security. Russia and Iran could together play a major role. Can Russia believe in, have, uh, in having a kind of a strategic part partnership with Iran rather than tactical partnership, which, rather, uh, which nowadays it has a tactical pa partnership, especially with regard to Syria and others. But we would like to see Russia change its policy and have a strategic partnership with Iran. Thank you. Great. Any other question? Uh, the lady back there. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank all the speakers for their words here. Uh, their con contribution is really precious. And I would like to ask... Can you uh, introduce yourself, please? Sorry? Yes, introduce I'm uh, Zoe Didili. I'm a graduate student uh, uh, at the Department of International and European Studies at the University of Macedonia. Um, so my question is... Why is Russia to blame uh, for trying to protect its interest in the Balkans and to, uh, trying to avoid the European influence and not also at the same time Europe, which is trying to protect and uh, which is trying to incorporate the Balkan countries in the European structure to avoid the Russian and the Muslim um, influence? Thank you. Great, thanks. Any other question? And the gentleman? Uh, 
Last question. Yes. Hello. My name is Dimostanis Dimopoulos. I'm a researcher on the Institute of International Relations of Padua University. Since we have both Russian and American uh, uh, speakers here, I would like to pose a question. Since, uh, as Professor Mersheimer has said, China's rise probably will not be peaceful, and it will already is a threat to United States interests and security globally, it will probably become a threat to Russia as well in the future. Wouldn't it be in the interest of both countries to put aside the misperceptions from the Cold War, settle the disputes and make come to an arrangement so they can, you know, balance the rising China? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a very short comment regarding Iran and one uh, question. Um, I think that uh, President Trump, uh, in, a, in a way, has uh, solved the issue with regard to Iran becoming a, a real competitor uh, uh, concerning uh, Europe's security of supply in natural gas with regard to Russia. Because as you know, Iran is the uh, only country that can compete in terms of quantities with, uh, with Russia. But after withdrawing, I mean, the, the withdrawal of uh, the United States uh, from the agreement on Iran's nuclear program, this means that uh, European companies cannot operate in Iran, uh, which is uh, an obstacle for feeding the European market with Iranian uh, nat natural gas. Just this brief comment. And uh, one uh, question. Uh, I would like to uh, have your projection on the INF Treaty and what uh, you think uh, will follow uh, regarding uh, this very important for Europe security, but not only uh, treaty. So, uh, would everybody want to answer to the questions, or I mean, okay, let's start with uh, Ms. Wallander. I'd be fast, um, and I'll join that with the first question. Um, I, uh, the consensus view of uh, American uh, security analysts is that the New START Treaty is in American national security interests. During the Obama administration, we offered to extend. New start, five more years, past 2021. Uh, the Russian government at the time didn't want to. They thought they'd wait for a better deal. That didn't work out so well. Um, I'm not sure this administration is interested. I know that the, there is strong uh, support for extending New Start in the American expert community, in the American governing community, but the guy in the White House might have a different view. Um, and that's always the question. Um, but if uh, you were talking to the broader set of experts in the United States, I think you would be able to come to agreement if the Russian Federation is interested. On INF, same thing. The, the Obama administration called out the violation, but was ready to talk about bringing Russia back into compliance and discuss potential uh, reciprocal uh, intrusive verification mechanisms. Uh, the Russian Federation didn't accept that offer while the Obama administration was uh, in office, and so now you got a different situation. I think the INF Treaty, unfortunately, is gone for good. Um, and I think that the United States is going to begin with its European and Asian allies to look at ways to mitigate the threat that Russian uh, non-compliant weapon systems pose to uh, the security of American allies in Europe and Asia. Unfortunately, I don't say that with pleasure. I say it with great regret. Um, and then quickly on, um, I won't answer all the questions, it's not fair, but on the balancing question, the American approach, believe it or not, despite, again, what you hear coming out of the White House, um, the American approach continues to be betting on it's in American interests for ri China's rise to be a rise of integration in the international system, not a realist power balancing <coughs> competition. And so I think that's one of the reasons why the stakes are so high for the United States in preserving the multilateral order, including international law, which is part of the multilateral order, because it's not just about Russia, it's not just about Europe, it's about China, and the terms of a peaceful rise for China. Thanks. Uh, anybody else who would like to respond? Dr. Yakunin. Uh, maybe I will be a little bit pessimistic. But I suppose I mentioned that, that the world is in transaction period, and it is Nobel laureate Stiglitz, it is your, um, uh, some European studies stating that the existing <coughs> the financial and economic system is not sustainable anymore. 
Since because of that, and still, despite the fact that pyramid is put upside down, meaning economy and politics, still, until the world is have uh, has a clear concept of the development of global uh, economic and political system, I don't foresee any attempt on the part of either uh, United States or other players. I suppose Russia is here a little bit secondary player, if you know what I mean from the terms of econ economy. So I don't foresee any uh, possibility of uh, serious changes in American politics uh, during at least coming 10 years. Thank you, Professor Litas. Thank you. Uh, I would like to comment on uh, my student's uh, question uh, regarding Syria and uh, the student from uh, Pandion regarding uh, China. First of all, as we have discussed many times, 2007 is uh, you know, a date uh, where uh, Russia adopts a new naval strategy and uh, this um, um, means that uh, from a green water fleet, uh, Russia tries to uh, modify its uh, a naval hard power into uh, a blue water fleet. Uh, the developments in Syria, and in particular the, um, uh, the not only Tartus or um, uh, Latakia, but in general, you know, the way that the Syrian civil war uh, developed um, signifies uh, and uh, gives um, uh, underlines uh, this uh, strategy. Also, it gives a very good lesson to the Western world that international politics abhors vacuum. Uh, regarding uh, China, uh, the point is that uh, my own approach uh, uh, regarding China is not uh, due to various reasons, China is not the traditional um, uh, power, you know, seeing imperialism as uh, uh, its own uh, uh, cookie, let's say. Um, however, if and when China uh, will try to uh, modify its own route, perhaps we will see another, and this is not a projection, this is just a food for thought, uh, perhaps then we will see another actor uh, in uh, international game, India. Uh, it's role in uh, balancing uh, future uh, China's um, um, uh, imperialistic uh, approach. Uh, it will be significant. Thank you. Ms. Montgomery. Just two quick points. On the Western Balkans, I would say, uh, you know, one of the reasons I focused my remarks on tactics is be t because tactics are a lot of where the problem lies. And in the Western Balkans, certainly it's fair for Russia, just like any other country, to pursue its interests. Uh, as Celeste said, wanting to revise uh, the status quo is, you know, every country has the right to try to do that and to pursue its interests. It's all about the tactics, um, and I would argue that an attempted coup is certainly not within the bounds of uh, international norms or ambassador international law. Um, on negotiations, I would just say that uh, for the last uh, three to four years, um, a number of Western countries have been trying to uh, get uh, Russia to implement the Minsk agreements, which it formally signed on to, uh, to end the conflict in eastern Ukraine. And we've been unsuccessful uh, in being able to do that. And so until we see some changes and some progress on implementing you know, agreements that have already been, uh, been signed, it's tough to see a lot of progress um, you know, in new negotiations. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lander. Um, thank you. Just on INF, it's dead. It's clearly dead. Um, the question is how you protect the Germans without scaring them to death, which has been a problem for um, a long time, and it is now again a problem, particularly if you don't deploy. And the one thing that didn't come up was Nord Stream, which I think is kind of interesting. Frankly, I have no problem with Russian gas. The problem to me is not German dependency. I don't think Germans are dependent on Russian gas. The problem is Ukraine, and we should talk about the real problem instead of the fake problem. There is, I think, interdependence in any case between Russia and the EU, because uh, Russia is uh, very much exposed to the European market. So, Ambassador, 
Uh, you are the last. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, how Russia and the United States can solve their differences, uh, the, that was the first question. Well, that needs uh, dialogue at different levels uh, on an equal footing. Uh, we don't have such dialogue at the moment, unfortunately. That uh, actually applies also to another question on the fate of the INF Treaty. Um, it's a bizarre situation, actually. Um, we have been uh, pointing out uh, a series of violations by the United States of that particular treaty. We were proposing to discuss our mutual concerns. Uh, the reply that we were getting from the United States no, 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 you have a missile which we don't like, which we believe is uh, in violation uh, of the treaty. When we ask for clarification, can you tell us what the number, the name of the missile is and why, uh, what data do you have, what evidence that it is violating the treaty? We didn't get any answer. At, at, uh, many months later, uh, the treaty was, uh, the, uh, the missile was identified. Uh, Russia uh, followed a very transparent way of handling the situation, inviting American, European, NATO, EU representatives uh, to actually uh, see the missile uh, in question. With all the descriptions and so on, the Americans failed to come. Uh, my view is that, and I actually agree with Stephen, that uh, the treaty is dead, unfortunately, because it was a very uh, successful treaty uh, on the basis of which uh, the uh, first and foremost beneficiary was Europe. Then, uh, on, on so this, uh, the new uh, START treaty, well, uh, actually we are uh, trying to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, get the Americans to a negotiating table to agree on an extension, because otherwise uh, it will expire at the date that I mentioned. And uh, I don't think we can uh, remain uh, comfortable uh, that it comes two weeks after the next inauguration. Uh, yeah, on, the, about Iran? on Iran. Well, I think uh, we should not try to uh, to de distinguish between strategic and uh, tactical. I think it's both in the economic uh, area and. Uh, in uh, energy uh, and uh, in a number of other uh, issues. Actually, uh, I can uh, confidently, uh, in full confidence, tell you that Russian-Iranian uh, cooperation on Syria in the format of uh, the Astana trio with Turkey also involved uh, is uh, today the best format and actually the only effective format of addressing uh, the situation in Syria. Now, on, on the Minsk agreement, Ms. Montgomery, did you read the Minsk agreements? Yes? Uh, how, many how many times is Russia mentioned there? Not a single time. So, uh, Russia, together with two European countries, France and Germany, they are guarantors of the treaty. They are not, uh, uh, not part of that uh, particular arrangement, whatever you think. Uh, and of course, uh, the problem with Minsk implementation is uh, procrastination uh, by the Kiev authorities. Should I also make a cap out? Oh. China. Yeah, China. Well, we don't perceive China to be a threat in, uh, in any foreseeable perspective. 
uh, we have the best relationship with China ever. Uh, and uh, I think uh, on the international scene, uh, there are, uh, on most issues, we are working in, uh, in consonance, including in the United Nations. Uh, actually, one example was yesterday during a vote on Venezuela. Uh, okay, uh, on the Balkans, finally. Uh, of course, Russia has its interests in the Balkans. It's a region uh, linked to Russia in many uh, ways. Uh, I don't accept uh, uh, references to alleged uh, coup attempt in Montenegro. What uh, I know is that it was not the Russian ambassador who spent a day in the Macedonian parliament trying to uh, to press uh, the members of that parliament to vote on the PRESPA agreement. It was the American ambassador. Uh, how that uh, situation evolved, if you are interested, I can tell you afterwards. Uh, that's why we believe uh, that uh, the fact that two neighboring countries, Greece and what is now referred to as the North in Macedonia, that they managed to solve the long-standing uh, difference could have been a positive achievement had it been done in a proper way, not in violation of the Macedonian constitution, not against the will of the majority of the population on both sides of the border. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. It's North Macedonia constitution and North Macedonia uh, parliament for us, at least. Uh, yeah. since, since the Presba Agreement has been ratified by both sides. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, uh, especially the uh, prominent speakers, but the audience as well, uh, for uh, being with us. I hope that you enjoyed our uh, discussion uh, as much as I did. And uh, we very much uh, look forward to uh, other uh, uh, discussions, not only with regard to Russia, the US, the West, but uh, please uh, do spend the next couple of days in a, in a constructive way uh, during your stay in, uh, in Delphi. Thank you very much. You can, you can.